Welcome back to a story to tell from the campus of Dixie State University. Today we're talking with Ski Ingram. Did I say that correctly? You did. Tell me what it sounds, is that your real name, Ski? No, that's my initials. Um, when I was drafted in the Army back in 1969, well, should I tell this story on camera? <laughs> sure. Well, it's up to you. <laughs> okay. Well, I was drafted in 1969 uh, during the height of the Vietnam War. And like most uh, young men at that time, I didn't want to go off to war. And um, uh, Green Beret came to our training one day and he asked us if we wanted to go to Green Beret training, shortening the story up a bit. And I said, well, that would be interesting. And he said, the training is so long, the war will be over before you graduate. <laughs> Was he right? No. Uh, <laughs> so uh, a bunch of us went down, took the test. Uh, only two of us passed which I thought was pretty good. And so I went off to Green Beret training. And while I was there, my real name, my birth given name is Sidney Kim Ingram. And my dad was Sid and I was Kim, K-I-M. And I didn't like either one of those names. And a friend of mine said, that doesn't suit a Green Beret. Why don't we call <laughs> you Ski? Because those are my initials, S-K-I. And it stuck. So since 19, probably 70, uh, I've been known as Ski Ingram, and it's just, that's who I am. Well, you look like Ski. Thank you. Do you actually <laughs> ski? I used to. Now that I'm older and broken, I don't. I've got a, a titanium rod in my shoulder here, and my hip is steel. I've got a brace on my knee, and I've got five deteriorating discs in my back, and I don't heal like I used to. So I try to stay away from the more, more dangerous or activities that I might get hurt and then have to be in bed for a while. Well, tell us a little bit more about the Green Beret thing. Ah, Green Berets, interesting. <laughs> They're a lot tougher these days than I was in my day. Although we were pretty tough. Um, I, was, I went through Green Beret training and then I went to Vietnam and I served as a ranger, as an airborne ranger. Green Berets learn very highly skilled uh, soldiers. Uh, they train in five different areas. I was a medic. I wanted to be a fireman paramedic. And so I went through medical training. Uh, there's, so there's Green Beret medics, communications specialists, weapons specialists, engineers, demolition specialists, uh, and um, uh, op uh, operations and intelligence officers. Was that five? I think I didn't count. I lost count. Yeah. Well, anyway, and so you train in one of those specialties and then you cross train in at least one, two, maybe three of the others. And then, uh, so your, but your job is not to fight the war. Your job is to teach other people how to fight their war. So what Green Berets were doing in those days, were going to Vietnam teaching the South Vietnamese Army how to, how to take their war to the enemy. As they do today, they go into all different countries to teach those armies, those indigenous forces, how to fight their, their own war. They do get involved in combat, of course, because as you might lead a team of indigenous forces to combat. So that's where the, you know, you're not sitting in a classroom doing that, you're doing it in, in the real world. Rangers, they're trained to uh, go out and fight the war. Special tactics, take the war to the enemy. Um, they do a lot of reconnaissance, which you uh, hide in the jungle or sneak around the jungle looking for the enemy so bigger forces can come in there and take care of the enemy. Or you go out in small groups to, to uh, you know, search and destroy missions, uh, uh, ambushes, um, POW snatches, uh, gather intelligence, that kind of thing. That's basically the difference between Rangers and Green Berets. A lot of people think Green Berets are there, are there to fight the enemy, but we're not, that's not really their main, their main job. It's the Ranger. That's a ranger's job, I think I had or an, an infantryman's job. I think I had a nephew that was a ranger in Vietnam. Oh, yeah. Do John you know? Rano. Yeah, there were rangers in Vietnam were assigned to different uh, divisions or companies. I was in November Company 75th Infantry, Airborne Rangers, attached to the 173rd Airborne Brigade. Uh, 173rd was the only brigade that were uh, airborne, all airborne. We were paid to jump out of airplanes, although we didn't get to jump in Vietnam. Um, well, that was rude of them, not letting you jump. I know, it really was, because if you jump in a combat zone, they give you a gold star to put on your jump wings. And we all wanted a gold star. 
but we, they didn't let us jump. But I was getting paid extra money to jump out of airplanes, although we didn't jump. Well, that was nice having to pay. That was nice, yes, yes. How and long, was, pardon me? How long were you in the military? I was in the military for eight years, and then uh, I got out of the military in 70, 77 and uh, joined the reserves, uh, then started to uh, look around to find, out a, find a police department that would hire me. Took me almost five years, but I got hired on a police department in Long Beach, California. I was served, uh, well, well, as soon as I got out of the military and joined the uh, reserves, I went through officer candidate school, became an officer, and then I got sent to, or I requested to be sent to the 12th Special Forces Group at um, uh, Fort MacArthur, California, out of San Pedro. So I was an officer in a Green Beret unit at that time. And I was there until I got hired on the police department. And did you spend the rest of your career there as a policeman? I spent 26 years as a policeman in Long Beach, Cal Long Beach California. Well, Long Beach is a nice place to live, isn't it? Long Beach is a wonderful place to be a police officer. Lots of things happen in Long Beach. We used to have a saying, all crime starts or ends in Long Beach. <laughs> and it pretty much does. <laughs> but the, the great thing about Long Beach is so diverse. You've got your downtown area where, you know, it's pretty much commercial, but there's a lot of crime. You've got your east end of town where it's just bedroom communities. You've got your University of California, Long Beach, uh, where there's, it's all trouble with college kids. You've got your shore area where it's marina, largest marina in all of, of California down there. And so you've got your shore people, that, you know, the beautiful people. You've got the people up north next to Compton where it's a lot of problems, a lot of crime. You've got your west side of Long Beach where it's a, a different low-end community where there's a lot of crime. So you get tired of doing one thing, get tired of handling crime, you can go out to East Long Beach and, and work with, in that bedroom community where you'll be bored 24-7. <laughs> I applied for a job in Compton, California. Ooh, once. as a what? <laughs> well, it had to do with the housing authority yeah. there. And, uh, what year was that? Because Compton was really being built up in the 60s, 70s. I'm trying to remember, it was probably in the 90s. Yeah. Pretty bad place then. Anyway, <laughs> I stayed in a motel, and when I got back from interviewing, uh, the woman said, you don't want to work here. <laughs> so I didn't, but anyway, it's small work. I didn't go to Compton very often. Yeah, tell me about your family. My family, uh, where do you want to begin? <laughs> well, your parents. Um, I was born in Salt Lake City, Utah. I've heard of that. Yes, uh, we um, moved to California when I was five. What part of California? Redondo Beach, California. Southern California, South Bay Area. And it was a wonderful place to grow up. I grew up to be a surfer dude, um, driving a sports car, going to high school, not paying much attention to high school, but having a lot of fun. And uh, now it's just too crowded and too many taxes and you can't, you, you can't afford to live there anymore. But it was a great place to grow up when I was a kid. Um, of course, when I got drafted in 69, I moved away. Um, um, when I, after, after uh, getting out of the Army, I moved back to California. Um, we, uh, the, well, let's see, I married a, a girl from, South, from um, San Pedro. Uh, we have four kids. We, they pretty much raised in, uh, in Lamita, California. And then uh, we moved, crime got a little dicey, and we wanted to get out of the LA school district, and we moved to Corona, California, which is right at the apex of the 91 and the, seven, or the uh, 15. Stayed there for 15 years almost when I retired, and then uh, moved to St. George. I've heard of St. George. It's a wonderful town. I love St. George. Why did you leave? Well, my kids couldn't make a living here. Um, and uh, I have two kids in, um, in, still in California, one in uh, Riverside, California, the other in Menifee, and then um, two in Arizona, one in Men uh, Mesa and one in uh, Santan Valley, which is right next to Queen Creek. And uh, I've got one grandchild in California and four in Arizona. And one day we decided that we want to be by the family. It's too hard for them to bring all the kids to us. And we decided, why don't we move there? So we just picked up one day, and within a month or so, we were gone. 
that fast. And we've been happy. We miss, you know, you miss it. This is a wonderful town. Let me tell you that. This is a wonderful town. And I miss it immensely. But I'm kind of glad I'm gone because I could get to see my grandkids. I get to see my son. <laughs> we went to a baseball game the other day, at, to a Diamondbacks game, and it was a great with my, my wife, my son, his wife, and their six-year-old son. Fantastic. And, and it was, yeah, fantastic experience. So I can't do that here. It takes eight hours to drive to Arizona from here. It takes them longer because they got to put four kids in car seats and drive here <laughs> so they don't come. <laughs> you drive faster than they do. I don't have to stop as often, yeah. Well, I told you before the show, we have a daughter that lives in Queen Creek, right. Santan Valley yeah. and so forth. Probably neighbors. Probably so. I, I live a seven-tenths of a mile from the border of, Saint, of Queen Creek. Yeah. It's a great little place to well, be. There's a, LDS Temple down there now. Gilbert Temple. Gilbert it's about, it um, might be six miles from my house. Yeah. So, go there quite often. I'm an ordinance worker there one day a week. In fact, that's where I'm supposed to be right now, except I'm here. Well, if you need an excuse, I'll write one out. I, got, I got somebody to uh, <laughs> okay. fill in for me today. <laughs> well, you're heavily involved with the Veterans Affairs. Tell us about that. Well, I'm a veteran. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Enough said. <laughs> When I came home from Vietnam, it was, um, you know, uh, hissing a byword to be a veteran, a Vietnam veteran. So you didn't mention it too often. I did because I didn't care. I didn't care what people say about me too much. As I'm getting older, I do start to care a little bit. But, you know, I could take those things and those arrows. I didn't mind too much. But people didn't talk about being a veteran until um, probably the Gulf War started maybe a little bit before that. After 9-11, for sure, started talking about giving veterans more respect. And I come here, and I always wanted to get involved with the VFW, the American Legion. And I moved here and uh, met a few people that were members of the American Legion. When I was a police officer, well, I was in the military, and when I was in a police officer, I always did the honor funerals for police officers and soldiers. Always involved in that. And I was talking to one of my friends, Johnny Johnson, don't know if you know him, great guy, well respected in the community. And he uh, tells, tries to get me involved. And one day I went to a funeral of a friend of mine, and here's the honor guard ritual team doing the military honors for this friend of mine. And my wife says, why don't you do that? And so I did. Just join to be on the honor team. Just do funerals. And I got um, pretty involved and ended up being the, um, uh, well, actually being the adjutant of Post 90, American Legion Post 90. And um, as the adjutant, which is a military term for secretary. Uh, <laughs> Sounds more important. <laughs> uh, I just got involved in things. And I like to do things well. I don't like it when it doesn't come off halfway or kind of cheesy. I want it to look good. And so I started just exerting my authority over things and making things the way I wanted it to be. And nobody complained, so I just kept doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Found your niche. <laughs> yeah, and it, it, was, it was great because uh, working with the veterans, uh, veterans are special people. The veterans in, the, in, in uh, post 90 here in town are just amazing. They will do whatever you ask them to do, for the most part. As you were at the ceremony yesterday, the mm -hmm. services for Memorial Day. I did nothing except bring everybody together. I get a lot of the credit because I'm kind of the face, but I just say, this is the way, well, this is what we want done, make it happen. And that's what they do. Um, I guess I learned that from officer candidate school. As a sergeant, you get it done. As an officer, you learn to pick good people to get your wishes or your, what you want done done. And What's your rank now? I have no rank. I'm, I've been out of the military for... What was your rank when you were in? Well, I retired in the, uh, from the regular army as a staff sergeant, uh, and, I and then I got out of the military as a first lieutenant. You know, so. so I'm always a lieutenant, I guess. In fact, a few of my 
friends here still call me LT. Because they don't call you hey you? Uh, no, those are my detractors, <laughs> <laughs> if they call me at all. <laughs> well, one time you wrote for the sampler? I still do. I um, started writing for uh, the senior sampler. Uh, my article is called The Veteran's Thoughts. It's just once a month. No set week of the month. It's just whenever I feel like sending something in, even. It's that kind of loose. And um, I just wanted to a place to vent with what's going on in the world. As a, vet, as a veteran, my thoughts as a veteran, how I th feel things should be. How I see things and how I want it to change. And I fully admit it's from my perspective as a retired police officer and as a veteran. And I get a, a lot of people that um, uh, praise me, agree with me, uh, encourage me to keep doing it, and probably more, 50%, at least 50% more that send me letters and emails and tell me I'm all full of it. You're kidding. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I've, re I've received some pretty, pretty bad stuff, pretty nasty stuff. Yeah. I save them all. If you ever want to look at them. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should have brought some. We could read them together here. <laughs> no, that or wouldn't not. be a good idea. They know who they are, uh, and I don't, I don't respond to them. I, well, uh, why would anyone want to criticize military service? Well, I don't always just talk about military to Jane service. Are Fonda? <laughs> Maybe so. Um, right after uh, President Trump was elected, there was a few things I liked. I wasn't a Trump supporter, and I said that from the beginning. I'm a Reagan Republican all the way. I voted for Ronald Reagan in 1976 when I was stationed in Germany and we had to send in our ballot and I could write in easily. So I wrote in Ronnie Reagan. And um, Did you write him in last year? No, I probably <laughs> should have. <laughs> but um, I voted, I held my nose and voted for Trump. I fully admit it. But there's a few things he's doing that I believe is good for the country. Not everything, but I liked what he was doing to get the country back on track to, to believe in itself again, like Ronald Reagan did, uh, to, to tell people that we are the best nation on earth and we can, we can help other people be, the be their best nation. And I expressed that, and then I got a lot of hate mail because people do not like Donald Trump. And, did uh, you know? that Trump won Washington County. I know. By yes. six, he got 67% yes. of the vote in Washington County. Right, I was a state delegate at that time. Um, I had just moved to Arizona, but uh, for well, that whole- I won't tell anybody. <laughs> for that whole uh, four years or so, I was always a Washington County delegate when I got involved in the, in the party and then uh, was a state delegate and ended up being vice chair of my precinct right before I moved. But when I did all that, I didn't know. It was happened. The move happened so fast. I apologized to everybody that thought I bailed on them, but it was just one of those things. One day I said to my wife, why are we here? And we ran through all the reasons I'm here. Like I volunteered like 18 or 19 different places, did different things, but I was missing my grandkids. I wasn't watching my grandkids grow up, and that's what I wanted to do. That's what my wife wanted to do. Well, that's great. How did you meet your wife? Well, that's an interesting story. Uh, the day I got my draft notice, <clears throat> I went to a church dance, and I met her older sister. That's the kiss of death, going to a church <laughs> dance. That's true. <laughs> and um, so I started dating her sister. I had two weeks before I had to report. And I dated, and she was kind of on the outs of her boyfriend, who is now her husband. And so uh, we dated for a couple of weeks, and I went off into the Army, and my wife was, I was 19, my wife was 16. Your and wife I, to be. To be, yeah. And uh, I know something clicked there. She started writing to me when I was in the Army and when I was in Vietnam, and we, every, everybody loved her, and we thought we'd get married, and then I came home from Vietnam, and I had, you know, little Vietnam crazies. And ended up marrying another girl who was the uh, post sergeant major's daughter. And he was uh, Paul B. Huff, a World War II Medal of Honor winner, the first paratrooper to earn a Medal of Honor ever. And uh, we got, I don't know what happened. I think back on, I think I was really crazy. 
got married. We were married for seven years. Didn't work. We won't go into all that. And uh, right after that, right after the marriage was on the outs, and she was in Tennessee with her parents, my wife Diane uh, came to St. George. My, she came to visit my parents who were living in Washington City at the time. And when I saw her, I had to go pick her up at the airport. When I saw her, it was almost love at first sight again. So we finished the divorce. I couldn't get divorced right away because I was going, to profit, going through officer candidate school at the time. And I didn't want to mess up with the security clearance. So we waited until I graduated. Number one in my class, distinguished honor graduate. Just throwing that out. Because that was, hard to, do. Things you that was hard to do during the time I'm getting divorced. <laughs> um, and then the, the, I graduated from OCS on July 21st. That was a Saturday in... Uh, in Reno, Nevada, then um, drove back to uh, Las Vegas where I was living at the time. That was a Sunday, and on Monday morning I was got a divorce. And then we got married a couple weeks later. And that's been almost 39 years ago. Been very happy ever since. I have four children. Um, my oldest daughter is almost 35. She works for the uh, uh, Riverside County Sheriff's Department as a 911 operator part time because she has a child and her husband's a battalion chief in the fire department. My son is, uh, he just uh, graduated, he's an Iraqi war vet and he's uh, in uh, marketing, just graduated from college after ha going for seven or eight years because he kept changing his major. They're in California and then I've got a, my oldest son's in in uh, Santan Valley. He works for Phoenix PD as the IT guy there. And my youngest daughter, who's in Mesa, works for Tempe PD as a 911 operator. All of them successful. They never ask me for money. They don't want to move back What in. is your secret? Uh, I'm well, a big, I'm a big boy scouter. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, Robert Baden Powell, who started Boy Scouting, was a wonderful person, one of my heroes. And he always said, tell a person what you want done and expect them to do it and they will generally do it. And they do. And we've expected things out of our children and they've, they've, they do it. Expectation, that's Expectation, the key. yeah. And don't settle for second best. Only settle for what you can be. What you, the best you can be. It might be second best because that's all you can do. I'm not an expert in everything. I didn't know how to put the mic on right today. But, uh, and I've been through well, a few I've of these interviews. Well, I've been in the business for 50 years and I didn't know how to put it on either. <laughs> well, do you have people put it on for you? See, that's sometimes. A, sometimes that's a problem because you never <laughs> learn those things. <laughs> but I've always wanted, I've always strived to do the best I can. And I think that's come across in our children. They always want to be the best that they can be. That's Knowing fair. that they can't always be the best, but they're not disappointed. They're not too upset when they don't, when they're not the best. I think we've made a mistake with children today. I shouldn't give my opinion, but uh, we don't expect enough of them. I think that's true. We have so many people that want to make it easy for them. Um, All rights and no responsibility. Right, right. I've taught that to many Boy Scout and, and different youth groups that I've talked to. Uh, w along with responsibility comes, you get rights, but you have to have that responsibility. You have to take credit for what you do. You can't apologize. Uh, I see so many people in the news say, I take full responsibility, and then they go on to blame everything else. Well, wait a, what responsibility is that? <laughs> Okay, and then they, then they get the pass. Well, they took responsibility, but what did they really do? So I expected that out of my children. You mentioned you get a lot of mail that's antagonistic. What's the theme of most of it, just in general? I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, How could you think that way? And they... <laughs> uh, <laughs> And they, I, most of the time, Lane, most of the time, I don't understand what they're talking about. I read the words, I understand the words, I understand the phrases, but it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. 
my wife has a saying when people talk and they don't really know what they're saying, it's word salad. Yeah, they put That's the words word. together. They throw all the words in the pot. But what do you get? You're not getting soup. You're getting, and I go, I watch the news and I listen to people and I go, what are you, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Because the words sound good. The phrases sound good. But when you link them all up together, I don't know what they're talking about. And that's what I get. Well, I find a dearth of facts and oh. a lot of opinion mm -hmm. and derogatory remarks. Yes, yes. And that if people said, well, this happened, this happened, it happened here, and therefore. Right, but exactly. They don't. Or they just ignore certain facts, his historical facts, for instance. Or they choose not to remember what happened yesterday and then just talk about today. So yesterday they said A, today they're saying B. And when you remind them that they said A yesterday, they just ignore it. They just go on. Yeah. Yeah, so it's. And I'm a, I'm a cop. I'm still a You're cop. A cop. <laughs> <laughs> what can be done to make it safer for cops? People have to support them. Used to get a lot of complaints when I was a cop. People would say, because they complain about some cops. Cops are human, you know. They do things. They say things that, that they shouldn't have. We all do it. All make mistakes. Yeah. But cops have the power of life and death or, you know, write you a ticket. You know, that's a big deal. And so they many times, and I've made my mistakes too, but sometimes when I was doing things right, they'd ask me, why did this guy do that? And I'd say, well, we have a problem. We have to get cops from the human race. That's a and great statement. It is because everybody has issues. Everybody has a good day and a bad day. A cop might come to work after finding something out about his wife or his, his son or in the hospital or whatever and they're not feeling well and then you say the wrong thing and they're they're on you we get have to get the cops from the human race that's exactly. one of the greatest statements exactly. i've ever heard well thank you i made that up <laughs> <laughs> well i'm going to steal it from you go ahead <laughs> our time is about gone we have 20 seconds left what's your final word oh final word i wish you had said this earlier um <laughs> You know, I think life is, is a challenge. And I, one thing, life is, is not a destination, it's a journey. Just, just go the journey and try to do the best you can. And try to remember people are human and they make mistakes and don't judge them on one single thing that you learn about them. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you very much for being with us. Well, thank you, Lena. I appreciate you having me. We've been speaking with Ski Ingram on A Story to Tell. Thank you for being with us.